All right, how about one more round of applause for Rex here, everyone? Please welcome Nicholas Cage. That's probably Arthur Kirkman's uh, treatment in your script. Correct. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think first and foremost, it's like, you know, the, the idea of the ultimate narcissistic uh, human being kind of archetype, and then use map on Dracula lore on top of that. And that's kind of, you know, I watched the YouTube video. Uh, <laughs> all the best Dracula movies, and guess what was considered the most um, accurate to the book? A 1971 Hungarian movie you've never heard of. But after that, it was the Coppola one, so anyway, yeah. I think, you know, it's also, you know, a lot of it was in the script, you, and then, you know, it's very intuitive to, to think of Dracula as the boss of hell. And that made a lot of sense, it's really one of the ones looking at it. And, yeah, I, you know, I wanted to make sure that our movie obviously had a lot of love to the past. I don't want to try to connect to, um, try to connect to the, you know, the original top around it. And, and, you know, play. the studio was on the out with fucking, you know, had, you know, Nick Cage just Dracula and every version of it. He would have been, you know, he would have been Chris Lee, we would have done a hammer. We would have done a hammer bit, we would have done a Franklin Jello bit, or, you know, we would have done, it would have 40 minutes of just stuff in the past. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> but what did you love? I mean, you know, Nick, 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 Nick Holt shot a lot more stuff. You know, we, we did the most of the top running things. They both were shot this time. And Nick, how about you? Did you, you know, what, which ones were you? Which Draculas were you watching over and over again? Well, Dracula is, uh, is a character, as we all know, it's been done many times. Um, been done well a few times, uh, but the lion's share has been done not so well. And I think the ones that I looked at, just as a starting point, were of course the, the Bella Lugosi one. Um, but, but Bella, as great as he was and that, wasn't my Dracula. My Dracula was Christopher Lee. I loved him in the hand of I loved his 16 pair of you, I loved the clothes, I loved his animality when he was on attack. And I looked at Oldman, I looked at Langella. Langella, I thought, brought a, a real charm to the Dracula character. But again, that was a starting off point. I had done Vampire's Kiss. Yeah! Yes! Woo! Um, Vampire's Kiss, you know, for some reason I started thinking about my father, who always, he was a literature professor, and he was also a writer, and he always spoke with distinction. He was like, yeah, Nicholas, let me explain something to you. <laughs> and, and Chris said, well, that's a good voice. He said, we didn't want to do the, the, you know, the Transylvanian accent, so I landed on that mid-Atlantic accent that my dad had, and believe it or not, I thought about Anne Bancroft as Mrs. Robinson in The Graduate. <laughs> she had that mid-Atlantic accent too, and there was something very Dracula seductive about her in that. So those were the two influences that I most looked at. But 
having said that, there was so much that just occurred on the set. You know, you open yourself up to the imagination and I was supporting Nick Holt and I got to watch him. I, I worked with him on The Weatherman, but in this one I got to see his comedic timing, which he has, he's so gifted with that. It's in his body, that timing. And then he could turn on a dime and be vulnerable. And I thought, okay, well, as a supporting actor, I'm gonna do this dance with him. And he helped me find where I could go. And then Chris was really on point. It's his vision and he's finding the right tonality. You all probably, you all love the uh, American Werewolf in London, right? That, yeah. that, that's, I saw that in the cinema as a teenager, and that I've always wanted to capture a tonality like that. I, and this is the first time I think I kind of got close with Chris's direction. He kept us in that zone. You talked about you know, being on set, coming to life, and learning new things. What about bringing, being here in New Orleans? Like, what did that bring to the film? Um, I mean, again, we talked about connection in the past. I mean, the, the, the reason Tissue of New Orleans is because it's kind of, it's the only city that feels like a European city in the United States. So there was some, you know, the French and Spanish architecture and all that kind of thing, you know, connected us to, to Europe. And so it felt like, again, you're kind of doing something new with Dracula, putting him here in the modern world, uh, but also still kind of, you know, reaching back to where he came from. And then just, you know, the fact that there's, you know, Vampire Cafe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Anne Rice, you know, and all of that stuff just felt me so, you know, and I'm, I love New Orleans, so I always wanted to shoot here, so it was self, self yeah, it, It's a great, it's a lot of fun to be here. This set had to be a lot of fun too, I and mean, you've got some amazing talent, uh, both here tonight, but then also like Aquafina, uh, then Schwartzman, I mean, some great comedic performances. How much did you get to stick with the stage, or with the, what was on the page when you were filming? And how much did you give people just the freedom to play? I mean, I, you know, obviously we, we, uh, we have a writer here, so. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, the um, best lines were improvised, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> believe me. And Ben had some amazing stuff. But, yeah, ben, ben was amazing. I mean, you know, obviously with, with what Ryan had written down, we were all really inspired by that, and it was a lot of fun. And, but I wanted to be able to play around, and I, you know, Nick came with some really. I mean, you know, just, when he was talking with you know with the voice of his dad, you know, he sort of he was just wanted to change certain words because they just sounded like a little more haughty or a little older sounding, a little more antique sounding, you know. And and, and then just you've got Ben Schwartz, you got Aquafina, you've got Nick Cage, you've got Nick Holt. Um, people brought a lot of you know fun, and I like I like things to feel really loose and. Um, I want it to feel like, you know, like, like spontaneous. And so anytime. Oh, sorry. What the, my voice is reflective. I'm really sorry. But um, I, I want it to feel spontaneous. And, uh, and so uh, I, I, you know, we sometimes we'd start with the script and we kind of just kind of go away from it. We just, just keep trying things and, and fucking around. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's where we kind of you know, had a lot of fun. And then sometimes that would inform us. I would come right back to the script and just kind of, you kind of bring it back around to the script, and then it kind of makes things, it kind of deepens the stuff that's going on in the scene. So, um, but, you know, a lot of, you know, this last stuff with, with, with Nick in particular, you know, was just the way he would use his body. You know, he, he really, like, he would just, he, I think, he, I didn't even realize this until we were talking about these, you know, a lot of the press stuff, but Nosferatu was like a movie song when was five years old. Yeah. And there's just a lot of stuff, like you just want to look at your, you know, all the stuff you've done in your career, just how, how you use your body, how you use, you know, your, your voice and things like that. Um, I just, I, to me, that I, I imagine that just had like a really memorable impression on me. Oh, you know, absolutely. Sure, I mean, my father was, we had a little movie uh, projector and a little screen, and he would put it up, and he was showing me. Cabin of Dr. Caligari and Max Shrek's performance in Nosferatu at five years old. And uh, <laughs> let me tell you, it was hard to sleep at that age. <laughs> yeah, I had to put it somewhere. So I think that's really where the idea came uh, to me later that, you know, why not try to bring a little bit of that flavor back to modern film performance? And that started really with Vampire's Kiss. But I like, you know, that he, you know, Chris is somebody, he's a director, what, what I love about working with Chris is he's, 
First of all, he loves actors, and he, and he does make you feel confident, and he knows what to tell you to make you feel free, you know, and that, that comes from confidence. Uh, I'd already been a fan of his movie, uh, the Lego Batman movie, and, Marvel <laughs> movie. and I knew what he could do with that, that he would, he would bring something, a special tone to this. But for him to let me, you know, I could say, well, what, what was it that Max Shrek was doing in Nosferatu before he turned into a puff of smoke and he does this little boop? I mean, that's such a, just a simple gesture, but it has so much meaning behind it, and yet it's so abstract. It's just minimal, but it's like dance. And then I, I wanted to do this, this posture. <laughs> just kind of like a, sort of a, kind of a Jagger, Iggy Pop thing going on. But he was like, well, this is the rock and roll Dracula, Nick. You gotta bring that to this, this character. I would, I'd love to bring you guys into the conversation. If anyone has a question, you can raise your hand. First hand I saw was right over there. Um, I wanted to ask, who do you think would win in a fight? Um, you playing Dracula or you playing Ghost Rider? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, well, you see, the Ghost Rider has a special secret weapon. He has the penance there, you see. And uh, I think if he laid that on Dracula, Dracula would have some serious stuff to sort out. <laughs> I don't know, but anytime I answer a comic book question, you know it goes viral. <laughs> oh, by the way, this man got a tattoo of this. Yeah! Of and it looks incredible. And I need to know the name of your artist because I might have to pay him a visit myself to get something. That's the, the attention to detail on that is superb. We drove from Chicago. We drove sh from Chicago. He wants to see it. <laughs> should I stand up? Should I stand up here? Up. Yeah, go, go, go. Yeah! Woo! Get a close up on this, but this is. Look at this. Look at look at that artwork. That's the attention to detail on that. Okay, so that's a great question. So, so Chris put together just a fantastic team, and I had the good fortune of working with Christian Tinsley, who is a real wizard in the makeup department. And with Chris, we all kind of designed, uh, Christian Tinsley, Chris McCain, and myself, what this Dracula look would be. So Christopher Lee came, came into it, but also the teeth. And there were like, was it four different looks? Four different looks. One look was like eight hours in the chair, which was the, what we called the Picasso look. Where I was really one hand over here, and my face is like a Picasso painting. That was eight hours, and I would fall asleep, and it was like this incredible sort of makeup shiatsu. And I was testing my face. Next, you gotta wake up now, you gotta sit up next. And, but the teeth, we had different levels of fangs. But it was a lot of ceramic material, and it was very hard to speak through it. So, because I wanted to speak with distinction, like August Kobla, I had to take the teeth home to the hotel and really practice with it to get some clarity with the vocalizations. But it was a lot of material in my mouth. But did you understand me okay, Lily? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's good to hear that. Good. Yeah. Good job. Did you feel like you discovered things about the character once you got in the full? I think that, you know, I was always, as you know, I was always fascinated by Lon Chaney Sr. and where he could go. I think all film actors should learn how to apply their own makeup. And, and the thing about it is when you get the external help, and I'm really saying this, Christian 
and, and Lisa Lovas, who did the magnificent wardrobe, all of that, yeah, incredible. All of that, that was, that was a huge part of the performance so because they put it on me and then it was like, no, Anthony, please, you just sort of look yourself in the mirror and go, wow. And you go inside and you find something to, to inform that appearance so it feels real, it feels organic, you don't feel like you're faking it. And a lot of the um, a lot of that a lot of, a lot of the stuff in the end, end credits is from the uh, camera tests that we did with with with, with Nick and Nick Holt. So that so that all of that stuff that Nick's doing there when he's yeah when he's when he's doing the uh, Max Shrek stuff and things like that that's from our for our camera test when we were all kind of really kind of inspired that that. Oh yeah, that was terrific because it was before it was definitely on, but Chris invited me to his office and he showed me some previous material and I knew right away he was on to something special. You know, he showed me like the, 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 the bodies exploding and the different looks for Dracula. And then he had his own little camera and we just started fooling around and I started coming up with these moves and thinking about, well, why don't we like go right into the lens like the shark and jaws and show the teeth. And, and so, oh, I like that, Nick. I like that. I do that one again this week. Even before it was definitely, you know, green light for the two of us working together, we, we, we just got into this creative spark together and there was a flow to it, you know, and I felt, I felt free with Chris McKay that I could, he would let me go places and that's always the best feeling when you're making a movie. I'll go in the far back row there, right? Dead center. Me? Yeah. Oh. Um, is yeah. that going to be in the Blu-ray? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the dance sequence is going to be in the, in the Blu-ray. We, uh, um, we, we shot this really wonderful scene in um, this alley in, in Bourbon Street, and uh, uh, we, we got uh, Jackie Wilson's uh, song, Higher and Higher. It's, it's, after, uh, it's after Renfield um, meets, meets Rebecca for the first time. Um, and so he's, he's sort of, you know, he's, he's feeling really great, and he goes out in the alley, and he starts dancing all of these other all the other dancers show up, there's three dancers, and there's a uh, dancing magus and dancing uh, kind of places, <laughs> dancing flies and things like that. It, 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 was, it was a lot of fun, it was just a little bit, unfortunately, it was a little bit redundant with the scene when he gets his apartment and that sort of thing, so I think from a pacing standpoint, we had to take it out, but it is going to be in the Blu-ray. Oh, we won't have Iron Iron, because Universal did not put up money with that. But uh, uh, you can see the dance and all. So it's, it's just one of those things where the studio really wanted to make this movie, you know, fast and stuff. So our pace of stuff, they want to keep it fast. So we can sink higher and higher to the. You know, I, the, the, the funny thing is, I pitched that. I said we can let's let's do something with a countdown. You know, that people can sink the song to it, and they did not. They they're so everyone's so worried about getting sued. <laughs> so, uh, there's a, they, they put a song that sort of sounds like higher and higher. Maybe not. Yeah, you should turn the same down and sing. I think we've got time for a few more. I'll go in the, the back back row there, the glasses. Okay, so uh, even though this is a genre film festival, Nick, I know that you, especially in the last last few years, done a lot of amazing genre films such like Colorado Space and Bandy. Oh wow! Oh. What is it as an actor, as a creative and film enthusiast, that really draws you to a lot of these genre projects? Is well, the thing about specifically horror, and we're all horror enthusiasts here, is, um, you know, I, I had uh, dreams of what we could do, meaning film actors, with film performance. And I was interested in, like, I also had this idea that what you could do in one art form, you could do in another. So if painters could become abstract and expressionistic, so could film actors. But the thing about it is, like, it, would, it wouldn't make any sense for me to go into that expressionistic style of acting for a movie like Pig. Um, because it, the context of the movie, the situations of the character don't lend itself to that. But in a movie like Vampire's Kiss, where the character is losing his mind, sadly, um, it's very conceivable 
that he could begin to think that he's Max Schreck and Nosferatu and start mirroring those moves so I could live my German expressionistic film performance dreams by playing this tragic character in a dark comedy about a man, sadly, who's losing his mind. Conversely, Dracula is a supernatural character who's signed a contract with dark forces, and that frees me up to be like the Iggy Pop. You know, I used to have a fantasy that I was going to go on stage and I was going to be really skinny and I was just gonna, and the music was going to go boom, boom, boom. I was just going to have a microphone like this and all I was going to say as a rock star was trick, 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 trick. <laughs> and so I wanted to put that move in his movie because I, I was basically saying trick, but he didn't know that. But the point is horror frees you so that you can have these wild, surrealistic, expressionistic moves and vocalizations. Yes. We do a couple more questions. I don't want to ignore the balcony. Thank so. you. This movie was fantastic. So awesome. Yeah. I have a question for the writer. Yeah. <laughs> Robert Kirkman called me. <laughs> said, I have an idea. I was like, great, what do I need to do? Just write the script for it? I was like, all right. So no, Robert came up with the idea, you know, um, the, the core idea of it. Um, but to answer your question, um, who here is familiar with Dan Harmon? Yeah. I worked with Dan for many years. I don't know if you're aware of Dan's reputation. Um, <laughs> you could be a tough boss. Nick, are you aware of Dan Harlan's reputation? I know the name, but I can't speak to the reputation. Well, uh, <laughs> he could be a tough boss. And um, now, uh, I, you know, wasn't going to say anything to Dan, but Dan and I had a drinks the other day, and um, his writer friend, uh, he was talking about how he wound up his writer friend, and he's like, hey, you see that, uh, that movie uh, Ridley wrote uh, about a uh, you know, guy working for Dracula, the world's worst boss, and how horrible it is? Where do you think he came up with that? <laughs> now, once again, Robert Kirkman came up with the idea, but yes, I was able to take all of my... I hope this doesn't become a press clip, or a... I hope this doesn't go Nick Cage talking about Marvel Comics viral. But yes, uh, Dan, you know, inspired me. Yet at the same time, I, I can't say that uh, the flip side of it, working for Dan, is, is of course learning from his genius. Right, everybody? Dan, Dan, for that quote? The intended codependence? The codependent anonymous beauty scared from you. Uh, oh, that was well, I mean, yeah, in, in, in the outline it was uh, kind of a weird, like, generic, like, lonely person's meeting, and I was like, well, the most obvious, you know, allegory here is Grant Field and, and Dracula would be the codependency, you know, relationship. So that was kind of an easy thing to map onto this kind of just the, the generic way that Dracula is. Grant Field is finding victims for Dracula. Yeah. Last question, right there, you. Great. Thank you. Hey y'all. So I do TikTok. I do horror TikTok a lot, and so I kind of like this little horror movies all the time. And I really wanted to know, kind of like her question, you guys brought back a universal monster into a new age movie. So I was wondering, question for all three, what other universal monster do you think could have a movie similar to Ringfield? And if and if so, which one would you want to do? <laughs> and that's my friend of the opera. I, I, look, I, I, I'll, all of them I think could be modernized in a fun way. I, I have an idea for a creature from the Black Lagoon movie, but I, I don't know. Yeah. And, and, and it wouldn't be a love story because that's been done. So it'd have to be, you know, him as him, it, whatever the creature from the Black Lagoon is, is some is a genuine scary monster. But anyway, I don't want to I, look. I don't want to uh, talk out of turn. Uh, it's up to Universal, but uh, yeah, I think that's a fun creature that we haven't seen recently in a, in a very a scary way. I mean, Shape of Water is great, but you really see that kind of as a viscerally scary monster with a kind of horror comedy, you know, angle. Like, if I were to do it. I thought what he did with Invisible Mammoth was pretty fantastic. That's 
the early funnel ad. But I mean, when you say like Renfield, are you talking specifically about the comedy and horror town? Yeah. I, well, see, American Werewolf in London, to me, I would say the Wolfman, but that did it so deliciously that I don't think he could, I mean, that's been done as the, in the Wolfman. Maybe Frank is but then you have young Frank is I don't know. That's a hard question because it has been done. So... I'm just glad I got to do it in this movie with uh, Nicole and Chris McKay and Aquafina. Yes! Thank you, all of you, for being here tonight. Thank you.